Hello everyone, this is Tay Kwan from Keene, New Hampshire, and this is your RIPE Global Implantology Case Review. I would like to present a patient of mine named Lori. And Lori presented to the office due to a fracture around the post on tooth number eight, which is the maxillary right central incisor. When you look at her case, you can clearly see there's some gingival erythema on the mesial buccal aspect of the incisor, which indicates the micro leakage between the post space and the crown. And as a result, the tooth was deemed unrestorable. And from general dentist, uh, the patient actually was referred to my practice for implant therapy. Well, when you look at Lori's case, there are many different ways that you can go. Uh, preferably, I always like to get primary closer when I do the extraction and bone graft, which means I do the bone graft and I close the site completely with soft tissue. Uh, but in certain cases, that's not the best way to do it, especially if patient is really nervous uh, and you want to keep the surgical site as less invasive as possible. And also, when you relatively have intact buccal plate or the four wall socket, uh, then sometimes I may actually do some procedures so that I can do it without achieving primary closure, which often makes the procedure less invasive. And I wanna show you how I do that in her case. So first thing first, we wanna make sure the tooth is extracted atraumatically. So without elevating any flap, I use per well, because a periotome uh, is a, one of the small instrument that is designed to be fit into the periodontal ligament space. I go in with periotome and then go around the tooth 360 degree. And I do not use any elevator in this case because a lot of time when you use an elevator in the maxillary anterior zone, you will tear the papilla. And we don't want to do that. I mean, her case was not a super aesthetic case, but Every single case, I treat them as super aesthetic case. Uh, why not achieve better aesthetic, right? Uh, so I recommend not to use any elevator when you actually do the extraction on the maxillary aesthetic zone. After I use the periosteum to sever the periodontal ligament and also microluxate this tooth with a periotome, I go in with 150 uh, or 151 forceps and then I just use the rotational force as opposed to luxate buccal lingually. Just rotate and then I put my finger on the buccal plate as I'm doing it and I rotate it and take the tooth out. And you can clearly see the papilla has been intact. Now after that, I have to create a space to tug my bone graft and a membrane. Especially if you can imagine, I want to tug the membrane between buccal plate and the soft tissue or the uh, gingival tissue that is surrounding it. And then to do that, I use, well, because a little bit of Orban knife, it's a knife that I use it for a lot of time for tunneling the soft tissue. And I pretty much go in and then create a little pouch between the gum tissue and the buccal plate. And the buccal plate had a little bit of fenestration in the middle, and I'm already aware of that as I'm cleaning this socket. After I do that, I tuck this membrane between the buccal plate and the soft tissue, and I start putting the bone graft in. This bone graft has been already pre-treated with growth factor, which is platelet-derived growth factor, which make the environment much more favorable for regeneration. And this is how it looks when you look at from the occlusal. So you can see I folded the membrane away and then I put my finger on the buckle, and then I push the bone graft as much as I can. And if you imagine there was a fenestration, right? So I wanna make sure that when I'm placing the bone in, the bone is actually pushing against this fenestration. Then I know that I filled all the way in. Because a lot of time, clinicians actually do not place too much force when they are putting the bone graft in, which leaves a void, and you don't wanna do that. So when you're doing the bone grafting, making sure you use the condenser. A lot of time I use the amalgam condenser and then push it really well so that you are really, really condensing the bone graft without creating any dead space. And after that, because I actually tunneled or we create a little pocket 
between the buccal soft tissue and buccal plate. I can even move this tissue slightly coronally with sutures. So you can actually see the size of the wound that is exposed or the membrane that is exposed is smaller than the size of the socket, which reduce the amount of healing by secondary intention which means there will be less chance for this membrane to be contaminated by saliva and food, and it will take less time for this soft tissue to completely close. And this is how it looks from the uh, frontal view. You can see that this has been done really nicely. I, in this case, I use 5-0 monocryl suture, which dissolve usually in the mouth about four to six weeks, because I want to make sure during that healing time this um, sutures do not prematurely resolve to the point where the flaps start opening up more. This is a little trick that I want to share also. At the end of the extraction, I always measure and take a photo with my periodontal probe. The reason for that is eventually I want to put an implant here and then it gives me some idea about what is the length of the socket, which will help me decide what will be the length of the implant too. Obviously with a CT scan, we don't have to do that often, but always having the idea about what it was the length of the tooth before the extraction always helped me to plan the size of the implant. So this was a very interesting case because I apply the principle of a traumatic extraction, which is the fundamental step to preserve the heart tissue. And then the way I prepare the recipient site for the bone graft and the way I minimize the amount of secondary healing by intention, uh, healing by secondary intention, was to apply my connective tissue graft skill, which is tunneling. I tunnel the buccal side to create a space to place the membrane. So I use the principle of the soft tissue, and then obviously I use the hard tissue, which is the socket grafting. So this is a combination of using not only the implantology concept, but pre-implantology concept, which is the atraumatic extraction, soft tissue, and heart tissue management. And obviously the suturing too. This is how the implant education should be tailored. If you're thinking about taking an implant course and just focus on placing the screw into a model or patient's head, maybe that's not enough you have to know how to manage the other things. If you want to learn that, please join us, Ripe Global Fellowship in Modern Implantology. Then I'll see you for the next case review. Take care and bye now.